Hello there, welcome back to the Pacific War Channel, where we cover the entire history of the Asia-Pacific War of 1937 to 1945, and all the major events that led up to it. Described as the Hermit Kingdom, Korea in the late 19th century saw a major war that saw one empire rise and another fall. This is part one of the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894 to 1895. Now before we begin, please hit that like and subscribe button as it would mean a lot to this little channel. And as you can see, I have another little parrot to feed. The Joseon Dynasty of Korea lasted approximately five centuries and was a tributary to the Qing Dynasty of China since the early 15th century. China held suzerainty over Korea, meaning the right to approve Korea's foreign policy decisions, but not to interfere with its domestic affairs. China chose a very laissez-faire policy when it came to Korea and did not directly involve itself in the affairs of Korea until the late 19th century, where our mess begins. So we've heard about Korea and China, but how does Japan fit into all of this? Japan had interest in Korea for both security and economic reasons. Korea was located in the vortex of Russia, China, and Japan. Korea had been the locus of two military clashes between China and Japan in 661 to 663 and in 1598. Hell, Korea was the staging area for two Mongolian invasions of Japan in 1274 and 1281. During Japan's Meiji Restoration period, reports of Russian, German, and Chinese ships being in the vicinity of Korea reached Japan strategists. This led them to refer to Korea as a dagger thrust at the heart of Japan. Japan worried that other countries, particularly Russia, might use Korea as a base from which to attack Japan. Thus, from the perspective of the Japanese, they needed to establish a military presence on the peninsula and prevent other countries from establishing a base there. All right, so let's get into this mess. In 1864, Chiyo Jung of the Joseon Dynasty died without a male heir. Through Korean succession, Go Jung became king of the throne at the age of 12. Since Go Jung was too young to rule, his father, Yao Wong Gung, became the Dao Wong Gun, a regent who ruled Korea until his son reached maturity. The Dao Wong Gun began to make reform strengthening the monarchy, but at the expense of the traditional aristocratic ruling class of Joseon dynasty known as the Yangban class. They made up mostly the civil servants and the military officers. The Dao Wong Gun also took up isolationist policies during a time when Asia was being opened up by the Western nations. You see, after China was forcefully opened up by nations like Britain, France, and America, they soon turned their attention towards Korea. In response, the Dao Wong Gun made isolationist policies similar to Japan's Sakuku policies to stop Westerners from exploiting them and earning Korea the nickname Hermit Kingdom. To thwart possible threats to his ruling power, the Dao Wong Gun selected an orphan girl of the Yu Hong Min clan to be his son's queen. You see, the in-laws to the Joseon monarch historically held a lot of power, and the Dao Wong Gun wanted to be absolute. Empress Myung Sun once married to his son, began to appoint all her relatives to important positions within the government. She also allied herself to the political enemies of the Jiang Gung, and by 1873, used all of her network to oust him from power. <laughs> well, I guess it didn't work out for him. This isn't my world. Disappointed! King Go Jung reached the age of 21 and officially replaced his father, the Jiang Wong Gun, as ruler of the Joshin dynasty, he proved to be much more willing to open Korea up and cooperate with nations like Japan more so than his father. He saw Japan as a model that perhaps his Korean kingdom might base itself upon. On September the 20th, 1875, the Japanese ship Onyo, under the command of Inoue Yoshika, was dispatched to survey the Korean coast. While surveying, the Japanese sailors put ashore on Gangwei Island, requesting water and provisions. According to the Japanese, the shore batteries of the Koreans suddenly fired upon the Anyo, and the Japanese began to retaliate by bombarding the forts and landing ashore. The Japanese torched several houses on the island and attacked Korean troops. Using their modern rifles against the Korean matchlocks, the Japanese butchered 35 Korean soldiers, and this became known as the Anyo Incident. Because of the conflict, King Gojong signed the Gangwei Treaty of 1876 with Japan, which opened up trade in three ports of Korea, Busan, Wansan, and Incheon. The treaty was also a Japanese attempt to end the Joseon dynasty status as a tributary state of the Qing dynasty by affirming Korea to be an independent state. Yet, despite this attempt, Korea still remained under Chinese suzerainty. During this time, China, Japan, and Korea were all anxious about Western advances and the danger of colonization. Russia was building the Trans-Siberian Railway and had established the cities of Vladivostok and Khabarovinsk along the coast and near northern Korea, 
Because of all of this, China began to take a more active role in Korea. During the 1880s, the royal family and Korea had become divided politically, and two rival factions emerged. There was the Saldadang faction, which were conservatives who sought to maintain power, sticking to the Chinese model, backed by the Daowongong. Then there was the Gaowaidang faction, a group mostly made up of Yangbang intellectuals who supported Meiji-style reforms and stronger relations with Japan, backed by Queen Min. Poor King Gojong was stuck in the middle. King Gojong gave in to the reformists in 1881, and a young Korean official named Kim Okyung, alongside 11 other Koreans, were sent to Japan on a mission very similar to the Iwakura mission that Japan sent to the West. The mission was to investigate all the aspects of the modernization process that was the Meiji Restoration. After the tour, Fukuzawa Yukikichi, a Japanese liberal intellectual, arranged for Kim to remain in Japan and study at Keiwei University. Over time, Kim became convinced that Japan's Meiji Restoration model was essential for Korea to survive the new modern world. When Kim came back to Korea, he became the de facto leader of the Gaowindang Party and began to promote reforms based on the Meiji model and desired to end what he saw as Chinese interference in Korea. It goes without saying his proposal saw major backlash from Korean conservatives who enjoyed good relationships with the Chinese. In 1881, Lee Hong-jong, our old friend from the Taiping Rebellion, was transferred responsibility for managing the Korean policy. Lee Hong-jong supported Korea's efforts to avoid conflict and promoted stability by having good relations with both China and Japan. In the early 1880s, King Gojong favored some Meiji reforms and invited Japanese military officials to help train 80 Korean cadets who would form the nucleus of a new modern Korean army. In July 1883, similar to the Japanese samurai revolts against the ending of the stipends preceding the Satsuma Rebellion, older Korean soldiers became very angry. They had been retired against their will and were waiting more than a year for their payment. When they received their pay in the form of rice, they found that the rice had been mixed with chaff, making it rot and became inedible. The infuriated soldiers seized weapons from the government's arsenals and took to the streets, attacking Korean reformers and the Japanese, who they saw as the culprits to their plight. Four Japanese officers who had been training the Korean military were killed alongside many Japanese citizens, and the Japanese legation was burnt down. The rioters tried to kill Queen Min, who was supposed to be in charge of the rice payments, but she escaped by being carried away on the back of her servant. The rioters did manage to kill one official of the Min family, and this event became known as the Imo Uprising of 1882. The Daowgun and conservatives supported the rioters, but King Gojong did not. So the Daowgun used the situation to take power. He removed from office all the officials from the Min family and executed his own brother, who had allied to Queen Min. Believers. No, stay here. I'm in charge. Do you feel in charge? It's pretty hardcore. In response to the killing of the Japanese, Japan sent a few hundred soldiers to Korea to protect its citizens and to support its Korean allies in the government. Although China did not support the Imo uprising, it was alarmed by Japanese troops coming to Korea, and in response, it sent 4,500 soldiers under General Wu Changqing. The Chinese forces quickly quelled the rebellion and defeated the much smaller Japanese force. Then China lent its support to the conservatives in the Korean government, thus abandoning its policy of suzerainty and taking a real active role in Korean domestic affairs for the first time in over 250 years. Yi Hongjong was furious with the Daowongun for upsetting the Sino-Japanese relations by overthrowing the lawful Korean government. Lee seized the Daowongun and took him to China, where he placed him under house arrest for over three years, and then he placed King Gojong back in power, alongside the Min family officials who had been dismissed. Lee then negotiated the Treaty of Chimulpo with Japan, which saw Japan getting a small indemnity payment with a formal apology. Chinese forces remained in Korea and in effect became an occupational army. Many Koreans saw China as their protector, but others saw China as an arrogant imperialist power interfering with Korean independence. Lee Hongjong sent a new capital guard to Seoul named Yuan Shukai, who would be in charge of training local Korean forces. As a result of all of this, King Gojong abandoned his earlier reformist policies, disappointing the Meiji reform enthusiasts in Korea. The Japanese took their minor defeat to heart and sought the advice of German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. His advice led them to create the Fukuko Keoe, enrich the country and strengthen the army slogan, and a new course for Japan. Japan issued an imperial edict authorizing the expansion of its military. Kim Okay-kun was frustrated by the Korean government's continued unwillingness to take steps towards the Meiji Restoration. This led him to initiate a poorly planned coup on December the 4th, 1884. This coup was called the Gapsin Coup because it occurred in the year of Gapsin in the East Asia 60-year cycle. 
Kim Mo Kyun admired the young samurai who overthrew the Shogunal government and initiated the Meiji Restoration in Japan. But with 3,000 Chinese troops still in Korea, he knew he had no chance of overthrowing the Korean government. However, when the French Sino War broke out in August 1884, China was forced to send troops to Vietnam to preserve Chinese interests there, and Kim found his opportunity to carry out his coup. Though Kim did not have the support of leaders in Tokyo, he did have support from some Japanese embassy staff in Korea and a small number of Japanese troops in Seoul. During a banquet celebrating the opening of Korea's new post office on December 4, 1884, when many conservative high officials opposing reforms were present, Kim's supporters set fire to a nearby building creating noise and confusion. They seized Kim Go-jung and took him to the palace. They then summoned various Korean barracks commanders who might mobilize the military against them one by one to the palace and killed them. Kim then promulgated a 14-point reform program and called for the termination of China's suzerainty over Korea and the abolition of the Yangbang class. Although Kim prepared a detailed list of reforms, he was astonishingly unprepared to implement them. His hope to maintain power with just 200 Japanese troops in Korea against 1,500 Chinese troops still stationed there was unrealistic to say the least. After three days, General Yin Shuke brought his Chinese troops to Seoul and a battle broke out. 180 people were killed, including 38 Japanese and 10 Chinese. The officials put in place by Kim were dismissed and Kim went on the run. Japanese citizens living in Seoul became targets for further attacks and their homes and businesses were looted and burnt. Kim and eight of his followers managed to escape to Japan aboard a Japanese ship anchored in Incheon. Now, before the coup, King Gujong had met with Kim and offered some support for his reform goals. After the coup, all those who supported such reforms were discredited. Kim was now regarded as a traitor for his bloody attacks. Many Koreans felt he should be executed. Kim would spend the rest of his life fearing for assassination. Ito Hirobumi and Leong Jung both made statesmanlike efforts to preserve the peace and maintain a workable Sino-Japanese relationship. In April 1885, they signed the Tianjin Convention, to which both Japan and China agreed to pull troops out of Korea within four months. The convention also stipulated that if either nation was to send troops to Korea in the future, they would first notify the other nation, which could also send troops. Chinese troops remained in areas near the Korean border, forcing Japan to accept China's greater influence over Korea. Many Koreans were happy to be rid of Kim Mo-kyun and his Japanese friends, but some complained that Yung chuk and his forces were overbearing on their government. The failed gaps in coup did not end Japan's efforts to cooperate with China and Korea against the West, but it did strengthen support in Japan for defending Japanese interests abroad. Unfortunately, the expression survival of the fittest, coined by Herbert Spencer in 1864, spread quickly in Japan and would be used to justify a belief in dominance of the strong over the weak. Japan saw European powers claiming to be civilized nations and establishing colonies in less civilized nations. They then exploited the resources of these colonies to benefit the home country. In 1886, the Beiyang fleet responsible for protecting China's northern coastline made a port call in Nagasaki, displaying four modern battleships, including the Dingyuan, purchased from Germany and far larger than any Japanese battleship at the time. The Chinese were showing Japan the great power of their fleet, with the implicit message that Japan should not be foolish enough to come into conflict with China. During the port call, scuffles broke out between Chinese sailors and Japanese locals in Nagasaki's red light district. Four Chinese sailors and two Mitsui police died in the scuffle. The Qing government did not apologize for the incident, and this created more animosity towards the Chinese in Japan and freshly after the Gapsian coup incident. The visit impressed Japan, but not in the way China had intended. After seeing the Jinyuan, the Japanese government decided to construct three large cruisers, each with a firepower capable of taking down the Jinyuan. After 1889, China continued to invest in the Summer Palace, but slowed significant investments into its navy. In contrast, Japan began to make significant investments into its naval construction and purchase of arms. Despite the tensions in Sino-Japanese relations around Korea, trade between China and Japan grew in the 1880s. Japanese businessmen expected trade with China to continue to grow and began to collect information on Chinese market opportunities. This information ended up giving Japan all the intelligence it required to start a war with China. On the other hand, China's reporting of Japan was surprisingly out of touch with reality. Beijing was being told by China's ambassador Wang Fengkao that the Japanese were so beset with internal squabbling they were unlikely to be active externally. Most importantly, the Chinese were not taking very much interest in Japan's naval activities. In early 1984, Kim Mo-ki-kyun was invited to visit Yi Hong-jung in Shanghai through a Korean acquaintance named Hong Joon. After a decade fearing his own assassination, he accepted this invitation, and on March 27th, en route to Shanghai on ship, Kim was shot by the Korean acquaintance 
who was actually tasked with his assassination. Kim Mo Ki-kyun's body was mutilated, cut up, and displayed in various Korean cities to show what happened to traitors to Korea working with the Japanese. Shortly after Kim's assassination, a rebellion broke out in Korea. The Dongyak Rebellion began with a religious sect called Dongyak, which meant Eastern Learning, who became angry that corrupt officials in Seoul were imposing higher taxes on local areas where their sect was residing. The Dongyaks were mostly made up of peasants who were unable to pay their higher taxes and feared losing their land. They were also very anti-Japanese since the 1870s when rice was increasingly being commercialized to Japanese merchants who would lend the money to local peasants, leading the peasants to not be able to repay the funds and thus would have their land confiscated. To them, this was exploitive and dishonest. In 1894, the Dong Haks saw a large amount of support, triggered by the actions of an oppressive county magistrate in northern Jola. The rebellion spread to the surrounding counties and King Go Jung sent a force of 800 soldiers to stamp down on the Dong Hak base in Jola. His troops were routed, utterly defeated, and many deserted while the Dong Haks grew and spread. King Go Jung panicked because the Dong Haks were gaining support from his own troops, and he was forced to ask the Chinese for aid. Now this is where things get really messy. Yi Hong Jung responded quickly on June the 7th, dispatching 2,000 troops to Incheon and 2,500 troops to Asan, led by Yue Jiechou, which lies 40 miles south of Seoul. He did not send them directly to Seoul, believing it would upset the Japanese. He planned to hit the Dongyak rebels as they marched on Chola to Seoul, hoping to thwart conflict with the Japanese. China states in accordance with the convention of Tianqin, he informed Japan of all of this before sending troops, and that Japan acknowledged this. Japan, upon hours of receiving the said notification from China, sent 8,000 troops to Korea under General Oshima Yoshimasa, but according to the Japanese, they did not receive any word from China. They simply acted when they found out about the situation. Thus, Japan was arguing China violated the convention of Tianqin, the Chinese forces quelled the Dongyak Rebellion in just a few days. Liang Zhong proposed to the Japanese that both countries should agree to withdraw, but Japan made a counter-proposal. Japan insisted that they should cooperate in assisting Korea to undertake the major steps towards modernization. The Chinese and Korean observers were convinced that Japan was driven not by a desire to promote Korea's economic development, but by its own economic interests, to obtain Korean grain at cheap prices. The Chinese government rejected this proposal and demanded the Japanese withdraw from Korea immediately. On July the 23rd, 1894, at 4 a.m., Two days after China refused Japan's counterproposal, the Japanese broke into the Korean royal palace, capturing the queen and one surviving prince, and held them for safekeeping, but did not apprehend King Gojong, so say the Japanese. They occupied Kyang, replacing the existing Korean government with members of the pro-Japanese faction whom granted Japan the right to expel the Qing forces while dispatching more Japanese troops to Korea. The Chinese government rejected the legitimacy of the new Korean government, and now things were tittering on the edge of war. This was the point of no return. On July the 25th, China sent four ships, cruiser Juan, torpedo gunboat Guanyi, and a troop ship Kuoxing with its escort gunboat Zhoujiang, planning to reinforce the forces in Korea. When they were passing near Pyeongdu, Feng Island for Westerners, near Incheon, they ran into three Japanese cruisers, the Akitsushima, Nanue, and the Yoshino, and the Japanese opened fire on them, starting a battle. The Kuang Yi took a volley of shells hitting her boiler room, leading her to take on water, and eventually she sunk. 37 of her crew died, and 71 managed to swim ashore. The Ji Yuan was hit multiple times and tried to make an escape. Just when the Japanese caught up to the Juan, did they notice the Kaoxing and the Zhuokyang in the distance. The three Japanese ships quickly intercepted the Kaoxing and the Zhuokyang, allowing the Ji Yuan to escape. The Tsuaqing surrendered immediately without a fight to the Akitsuma. The Kaoxing had an English captain named Thomas Ryder Galsworthy. Galsworthy assumed the Japanese would focus on the Chinese gunboat, Tsuaqing, since they were a British chartered transport ship, thinking he was safe and under the protection of the British civil in Singma. The Japanese ordered the Kaoxing to follow the Nanue, and Captain Galsworthy agreed. The Chinese soldiers aboard, however, objected and threatened to kill the British crew unless Galsworthy took them back to China. After four hours of negotiation, and while the Chinese soldiers were distracted, Galsworthy and the British crew jumped overboard, attempting to swim to the Nanua when they were fired upon by Chinese soldiers. Galsworthy and two crewmen survived and were rescued by the Japanese while the others died to Chinese gunfire. Nanue then opened fire on the Kaoxing, sinking her. 300 of her crew survived, swimming away, one including German military advisor Major Konstantin von Hanenkenen. Over 1,100 Chinese died, the Japanese suffered light casualties, and only one ship was lightly damaged. 
All of this left Oshima and Yu Chang's forces isolated on the Korean mainland poised to fight. The First Sino-Japanese War had unofficially begun. So just to summarize everything we've learned in this episode, the Korean political situation was divided between Chinese and Japanese spheres of influence. A bunch of riots, coups, and military accidents led China and Japan both fighting for greater influence over Korea. When China and Japan finally got to the boiling point, it seemed that it would be Japan who would deal the first blow. I hope you liked this episode, and please join me next time for part two of the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894 to 1895. And if you have not already done so, please hit that like, subscribe button, leave a comment, helps with the algorithm, because this little guy, he likes himself some peanuts. This has been the Pacific War Channel, over and out.